first come out. While we're the screen's coming up, let me go over a couple of announcements. And this one may be of great interest to you, but not a lot of time. Okay. Now this class gets through at ten four uh, eleven fifteen. All right. All right. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So you won't have a lot of time, but you do have some time. Today is College Transfer Day here at the Vesper campus. Yesterday was on the Birmingham campus. They sent this to us yesterday morning. So didn't have a lot of time to announce it. And that started at 9.30, okay, and it goes till 11.30. Uh, on this campus is in the faculty staff dining room, which it says faculty cafeteria, but it's called faculty staff dining room. It's just next to the cafeteria, immediately next to it. You can enter it from the cafeteria. You can enter it from right before you go to the cafeteria, or you can enter it in the hallway across from the rec room, okay? Uh, it's three doors that go into it, uh, and they'll be there until 1130. And here are some of the institutions that will be there, okay, or at least they were scheduled to be here, okay. Our AUM, Mississippi State, University of Alabama, they're listed a couple times here, University of Montevallo, Alabama State University, Auburn University School of Forestry and Wildlife Sciences, Alabama A&M University, University of West Georgia, Auburn University, Jacksonville State University, Stillman College, University of Alabama again, UAB, University of Alabama Huntsville, UAH, University of West Alabama, Troy University, University of South Alabama, University of Alabama College of Continuing Studies, Athens State University, UAB School of Health Professions, U uh, UNA, University of North Alabama, Sanford University, Fisk University, Mississippi College, Tennessee State University, Faulkner University, Southeastern Bible College, Talladega College, Georgia Southwestern State University, and William Carey University. Wow, what a lineup. And they're all down, or I assume they're all down there right now at the uh, faculty staff dining room. And that's uh, right next to the cafeteria. They'll be there through 11:30. So, right after class, hustle down there if you need to see some of them. Even if you're not yet at the point of wanting to do, just the experience of talking with the recruiters and things like that might be a pretty good deal. Okay. And then I think I announced to you last time about the Alabama A&M University starting a Norris scholarship program. Okay. I found out some more information about that. One of my students in yesterday's class pulled it up on his phone. They don't have the summer program that both Alabama and UAB had when they were at Norris because you can do whatever you want to. What a a Alabama A&M does is provides free tuition your junior and senior years if you're in uh, teaching math or science. If, if that's your major, math or science education. They will provide free tuition if you're accepted to the program. So still may be worth a shot going to it, looking into it. Uh, you've got it on your email. It came to the students as well as to me, and there's a link there. You can find out more information. That's what the guy yesterday did. Just pulled it up on his phone to see the information. All right. Pretty good deal, though. But, oh, yes, thank you. Uh, I announced this before. I had no takers before. But a few years ago, not too many, but a few, uh, one of the students in this class got the text, and it actually has web assigned unopened, and said, yeah, we need that. Uh, and this is just the chapters we do, 4, 1 through 4, 5, and 6. So she has the stuff here. Oh, she has her information, too. I need to check that out. Uh, you don't need to know her. that out but the rest of it is yours for the taking uh, if anyone doesn't have a book and you would like something to look at it's here free you can have it if anyone needs it there it is okay now let's see a few more people came in while I was yakking my mouth okay Satan okay I thought so 
Corinthia, not. Okay. Jake didn't. Brian didn't. Okay. Okay, that's a yeah, okay. Three's here. Is that all that came in? Anybody else from Oh, I, yeah, that's right. You came from sorry. Patience. Okay, good. All right, any, no one else. So let me make sure. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. 4, 6, 8, 10, 11. Got it, got it, got it, got it. Okay. How have I started? Yeah, I started screen, Screencast-O-Matic. It's ticking away. I did that before the announcement. Okay, we're still on Chapter 4. <laughs> it's a long chapter. Uh, trigonometry. 4.6 is graphs of other trigonometric functions. Okay, what do we mean by other? We've already done sines and cosines. Okay, but don't forget sines and cosines. You'll be using them especially on the last two we do. Okay, All right. so what we'll do is sketch the graph of tangent functions, sketch the graph of cotangent functions, and then we'll sketch the graphs of secant and cosecant functions. That's where we'll be using sines and cosines again. And we'll sketch graphs of damped trigonometric functions. Be sure you put the P in there. Okay, never mind. All right. So, what does a graph of a tangent function look like? And again, we're going to recall, recall features of sine and cosine. They go into play everywhere here. We know that the tangent function is odd. Oh, well, it's a strange function, isn't it? It's odd. Not even. That is, the tangent of negative x is minus tangent x. How do we know that? Well, sine is odd, cosine is even, it's the product of the quotient of those two, so it turns out being odd, odd intercept. Okay, consequently, the graph of y is equal to tangent x is symmetric with respect to the origin. That's what it means to be odd. Okay? You also know, it says you do anyway, from the identity that sine, the tangent x is sine of the cosine. So I said, see, they're coming into play again. Now, where this comes into play with tangent, as with the others too, is when you time you see a variable in the denominator, beware. What can it never be? The denominator can't be zero. Now, when is cosine zero? When is cosine zero? Hmm, thinking that far back? When is cosine zero? At what values of x? Where does cosine start? At one. And where does it go down to zero? Pi halves, exactly. And in fact, at every Half pi cosine is zero. So pi halves and minus pi halves, and three halves pi, negative three halves pi, five halves pi, seven halves pi. Every half pi cosine is zero. So therefore, tangent is not defined at any of the half pi's. Okay? So when we said it's uh, an odd function and what it does on one side or the other, as it gets close to pi halves or negative pi halves, it's going to an infinity. In the opposite direction. Positive infinity for in the first quadrant, negative infinity in the fourth quadrant. Okay? So it's undefined for values for which cosine equals zero. Undefined, translate that to vertical asymptotes. Okay? And two of these such values are x equals plus or minus pi halves, which is approximately plus or minus 1.5708. Now, why did they do that? Because the next thing they're going to do is set up a little table here for you. And I think they're going to start at 1.5. And then they're going to do 1.57. And they're going to do 1.58 or something like that. Well, no, they won't go as far as that. But let's see what they do. Here is the table. Oh, they're starting at negative pi halves. Okay, I thought we were going to do pi halves. Okay? We don't know what it is there. But let's start at negative 1.57. Whoa! Pull it on your calculator. It's got your no, uh, uh, and see what you get. Okay? A very large negative number. Negative 1.5. Uh, a large 
large number, negative number, but not as large as this one. And it doesn't go up nearly as fast, okay? Negative pi four is eight. We knew that one, didn't we? One. It's not getting big. Okay. It's thrown to you? All right, so we're just missing Jake, Brian, Dimitri, ooh, missing one of all. Stephanie, yeah, okay. All right, let's leave that, we come to you too. All right, at pi force is minus one, at negative pi force is minus one, zero at zero, cosine is zero over one, cosine, uh, then that's zero. At pi force, one, 1.5, 14.1, exact you see, odd function. Yeah. Uh, tangent of negative x is negative tangent of x, okay? And that's 1.57 up to 1255. You did 1.5707. You get an even more incredibly large number, okay? And then I have undefined. It won't even. So, as indicated from the table, tangent increases without bound as x is breaking pi halves to the left, from the left, decreases without bound as x approaches negative tangent from the negative pi halves to the right. And then it will pick up and do the same thing for the next period, next period, next period. Okay. Now, here's a, what the graph of y is equal to tangent x looks like. Vertical asymptotes at every half pi. We knew that, okay, because cosine is zero there. So we have to have vertical asymptotes every half pi. Now, I know that sine and cosine were continuous functions. They didn't have vertical asymptotes. So I know that's different here. And they didn't go to infinity. They were limited to plus or minus one. But what's another difference between sine and cosine and tangent that you notice here? This repeats itself every every pi. And what is sine and cosine? They were hundred. It's two pi's. Okay, two pi's for every note. Okay, so they were every two pi. Tangent and cotangent are the only two trig functions that have a period of pi, not two pi pi. So the period is pi. Here is the uh, the graph. The main all real numbers except those half pi's. Okay, uh, pi halves plus n pi. Every multiple of pi past pi halves. Range. Big difference here. Negative infinity to positive infinity. Sine and cosine plus or minus one. Okay. Vertical asymptotes. That's where the domain's not defined. That's at your half pi. Uh, pi half plus n pi. And symmetric about the origin. A lot like sine. In fact, I say a lot like sine. If you remember how sine looks, it's uh, down to minus 1 here, goes up, and goes up here to plus 1. So actually, right in here, near 0, sine and uh, tangent are really close to each other. Okay. Now, um, the reason for that is cosine is very close to one. Okay, it is one at zero, and up, up on either side of that, they're very close to one. So since sine and tangent differ only by a very little difference in the number one near the origin, okay. they are symmetric about the origin. Any questions? Okay. Moreover. Because the period of the tangent function is pi, and here's another reason the period of the tangent function is pi. You think about your sines, S I G N signs. What are they here? All positive. Uh, uh, sine and cosecant. Tangent and cotangent. Cosine and secant. So you see, you have to go all the way around before, because sine, take a sine question, positive, positive, negative, negative. You've got to get all the way around to get positive again. Cosine, positive, negative, negative, positive. You've got to get here to get back to positive again, okay? But tangent and 
go ten positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative. They repeat every time. Okay. So that's the other reason they have they have only two functions, trig functions, that have a period of time. Okay. Yeah. I think we've got that. So sketching. So here we go again. Now, usually they don't do a plus D here with sines and cotet, I mean tangent and cotet. You could, but most of the time they don't, okay? It's usually only sines and cosines when you uh, do a, a horizontal, a vertical shift. So these just use A, B, and C, okay? Now, what was A for sine and cosine? What did it re relate to? Amplitude. Which was the maximum in values, right? So, tangents and cotangents? Or you all know about cotangents. Do tangents have maximum in values? No, they go to infinities, okay? So they don't have that, but don't throw away your A. It's still an important parameter. It just has a different meaning for a tangent and cotangent. I keep saying cotangent, we'll get to that later. And then the B relates to. The period. But you remember now for sine and cosine, how did you get the period from a B? 2 pi over B. So guess what you do with tangent? Pi over B because the period is pi, not 2 pi. Now the C again, I want to pull the B out and you know, do it differently like I usually do. They keep it in and then make the C over B your phase shift. Factor the B out to begin with, then what's left here would be your face shift, which makes more sense for me. But so you that still holds. The B is very similar. The only difference is it's pi over B, not two pi over B. The C phase shifts just like before. The A is related, in a sense, to how stretched or unstretched it is, but it's not an amplitude anymore. But it's an important parameter. Okay, so sketching the graph, so sketching the graph of this, similar to that, is that you locate your key points, okay? But because your period is what? The tangent. You take the period and divide by four, so you're, now your interval is the period of the four, just like it was before, except the period is pi. So it's usually uh, pi force, or whatever your period is, and the meter. All right, good deal. Okay. And, and here's the other little difference here. It says you identify the intercepts. There are no max and min, but it's the asymptotes. But there is something else you want to identify. They don't list it here. I'll show you what it is. Okay. So they may not, well, let's go with it. So two consecutive, and this is how they do theirs, and it's perfectly fine. I just find it awkward, uh, but you can do it this way. Two consecutive vertical asymptotes can be found by wherever that argument is for your tangent. Let's go back to that. Tangent of B plus C, BX minus C, wherever that is, two uh, pi halves or any multiple, in pi multiple of that then uh, that's where your vertical asymptotes are, okay? That's how you get them. So they say that, do it. Do it my way, it's a lot easier, but this is, that certainly works here. It's either minor pi halves or pi halves, or, and then you just do your uh, period from then on. The midpoint between two consecutive vertical asymptotes is your intercept, okay? Now, they, don't, they stop right there. I take you one more step. The midpoint between your intercept and either vertical asymptote is then going to be your quarter period, right? The quarter periods. And that's where your value is plus or minus A. Either minus on this side, plus on this side. That's where the A comes into play. So 
Don't throw out the A just because you don't have an amplitude. That identifies the value at the quarter periods. Okay? So they don't talk about that, but I do. And that's where your plus or minus A is at the quarter period. They just talk about these. If you use that, then you'll have another point, two points to uh, to do. The period of the function is the distance between the two consecutive vertical asymptotes. It's also the distance between two consecutive intercepts. Everything is is your period one period away from the previous. Okay. The amplitude of the tangent function is not defined. However, the A tells you where you are at your quarter periods. So remember that. After plotting the asymptotes and the k the x intercept, I'm going to take of them. X intercept. Plot a few additional points between the two asymptotes and sketch one cycle. Guess which one I'm going to say plot? Your quarter periods. You know exactly what they are. You don't have to even think about it. You don't have to use the calculator. They're at plus or minus A. Finally, sketch one or two additional cycles to the left and to the right, and you got it. Down, up, down, right, right, right. Okay. So let's do it. Here is the function y is equal to the tangent of x over 2. Okay, let me get my pen set up. Okay. How do we begin before when we did sines and cosines? Identify your parameters. A, B, C. We don't have to do a D. It's as simple as A, B, C. Never mind. Okay. So what's your A? One. What's your B? One half. What's your C? Zero. You don't have a C. Good deal. And we don't have a D either, but we're not even going to worry about that. Okay, A relates to? Tega? That's for sine and cosine. For tangent? The value of your quarter period. Remember that. Value of the quarter period. So it's 1. We'll remember that. What does B relate to? Second, the period. And what is the period if you know the B? Pi over B, which is 1 half, which would be what? Pi divided by 1 half. Be pi divided by 1 over 2. Same as pi times 2 over 1, which is 2 pi. Okay. So here we're back at 2 pi again. And your C, of course, is 0. Okay. So here we're ready to sketch the graph. All right. Oh, whoops, I forgot. Once you get your period, what do you get then? Your interval. So what's your intervals? Pi halves, 2 pi divided by 4. Divide the period by 4, just like we did before, and this will be pi halves. Without the 1 half in there, that would have been a pi fourth. Okay, so that's where I'm going to go here. I'm going to put a 1 here and a minus 1, even though we know that's not going to be a max or min, but I'm still going to put them. And then I'll do a pi fourth, pi halves, 3 quarters, pi, 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 pi. Okay, and here, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so this will be pi quarters, pi halves, pi, one, two, three, two pi, way over there. Pi quarters, pi halves, pi, oh, negative pi quarter, negative pi half, negative pi, and I don't have enough for that one. Okay. Now, where do we begin? Second? You what? Vertical asymptote. Very good. I like to do those in red to remind myself you can't touch them. Okay? Stay away from them. Get close, but don't touch. I can't get red to come up. Ah, there we go. 
And where are your vertical asymptotes? Anybody? Say again? Plus or minus pi. Wait. Yeah. Normally it would be pi halves, but because we got a thing going here, a horizontal stretch of that one half, it'll be plus or minus pi. Okay. Now, how do you get that? It's half a period. Your period was 2 pi, half a period is pi. Starts here, and maybe I should have asked that first. Where does tangent begin? That may have been the better first question. Tangent begins at the origin. Whoa, that was supposed to have changed color. It didn't. There it is. There it is. Boy, the colors are not one. Okay, here we go. Okay, there is the tangent typically begins. If you don't have a phase shift, it begins at the origin, just like sine does. Okay? Remember? I said it was even shaped a lot like sine. And half a period to the right is a vertical asymptote, half a period to the left. That's probably how it should have begun. And then, what else do we consider? Your quarter periods. Now, why did I do pi fourths anyway? I should have been doing my intervals of pi halves. Y'all should have stopped me. What are you doing there? Okay. I got this way too stretched out here. You're at pi halves. That's where you are at your plus A on this side, minus A on this side. So this is where the A comes into play. Plus A and minus A on either side. And then you're going to your asymptote. So this is what it looks like. Oops, yeah. Or uh, something like that. I got this one all squared. I got too stretched out here, too compacted over there. But that's what you got. That's what a tangent fun function looks like. Starts at the origin. Half a period to the right is a vertical asymptote. Half a period to the left is a vertical asymptote. In between the uh, intercepts is a vertical asymptote. That's where your uh, minus A is. That's where your plus A is. Which were your amplitudes for sine and cosine, plus or minus a? Here, it's, uh, that's just another point on the graph. That is an important a value point to get you going in the right direction. Okay? So tangents aren't too hard to graph either. Do you see? Make sense? Okay, that was example. That was our version of example one. Let's see how they do it. I know what they start off with, and it's sort of a pain in the neck. Uh, by solving the equation x over 2, which is your argument of the tangent, is equal to minus pi halves or plus pi halves, you get your vertical asymptotes. And if you like starting that way, it certainly works. Here it's really easy, minus pi and plus pi, which is exactly what we got. Okay? So you could construct... Consecutive vertical asymptotes occur at minus pi and pi. Okay? Now, see, they never say use the B to determine your period. But since we've been doing that with sines and cosines, do it here too. It's just B or, or pi over B rather than 2 pi over B. So here we got the vertical asymptotes of minus pi and pi, and then halfway in between, they never say that, but halfway in between your asymptotes and your intercepts, that's where your quarter periods are, and that's where your minus a and plus a. If it just says that, this would make it all pretty reasonable. But they don't use the b. They use the other thing to give you the asymptotes, and then they go from there. Which is fine. It's perfectly fine. But since you used a, b, and c before, why don't you keep using them now? Okay. Any questions? And this is how the graph looks. Almost as pretty as mine, but close. Okay. And you see, if you do your quarter periods, it would be, I should have, pi halves, pi, three halves, yeah, blah, blah, blah. That's what I should have plotted. Quarter periods. Half a period away is a vertical asymptote. So it starts at the origin. Half a period on either side, vertical asymptote. A quarter period on either side, you minus a, you plus a. Minus one, you plus. That's it. You know, just using the ABC. 
C was zero here. Okay. Any questions? Okay. They are skipping to lose their darling. Example two. So let's do example two. Usually when they skip them like that means there's more to do with it. Sketch the graph of this. Y is equal to Ryan's here. Okay. All right. Whoops, I just messed up. I put Jake here and not Ryan. Okay. So you're not here in that. Okay. All right. Okay, you're Jake now. Okay. Okay. Here's example two, which is on the slide set. We'll do it here. Y is equal to negative three times the, whoops. Oh, and by the way, every example has a check yourself, or a checkpoint. Please do the checkpoint short, shortly after, uh, as soon as you can after class. So uh, example two, Y is equal to negative three tangent two X. Okay. Let's identify our parameters. What do you have? A is equal to negative 3. Next. Next. After A is, B is 2. What does B relate to? Period. How does it relate to the period? It's what? Pi over B. Pi over 2. There's your period. Pi over 2. And what do you do once you get your period? Divide by 4. So your interval will be? Pi halves divided by 4 is? Okay, divide by 4, not multiply by 4. Divide the period by 4. Pi 8. Perfect. Okay. And then what you see? 0. No phase shift. Okay. So let's set up our axes. And we'll do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And a negative 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Somewhere out there. And here we better do at least 1, 2, 3 up and what at least 3 down. Okay, that was your A. Alright. Now, since there's no phase shift, C is 0, then where does tangent begin? Origin, right there. Okay, got that one. And, oh, let's identify our intervals are pi 8, so this would be pi 8, pi quarters, pi halves, and 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, pi. And this will be minus pi 8, minus pi quarters, minus pi halves, and I don't have enough to get to minus pi there, because let's scoot it to the left a little bit here. Okay, identify the origin. And then half a period away from the intercept, you find a hint, I'm going to red, a vertical asymptote. And what's half of your period? Periods pi halves, half of that is? Second, pi fourths. Okay, so there's your vertical asymptote here and minus pi fourths here. Okay, and then do one period away. A period is pi halves, so this is one, two, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, oh, I can't do that one, one, two, three, four, so just go four quarters away, okay, like that. Now, obviously, my spacing is a little, leaves a little to be desired, okay. Okay, the asymptotes are half a period from the intercept. So if you know where the intercept is, and tangent usually starts, okay, tangent is always going to start at the phase shift. And here the phase shift is zero, it starts right there. So there. Do 
is half a period. Period is pi half, and I know how we got that right. V over, sorry, pi over V, and V was 2, so pi over 2 is pi half. So half of the period away to the right is a work for asymptote, and half the period away to the left, negative pi four. That's the work for asymptote. And then you count off one period between each part. That's one, two, three, four. Four intervals, one, two, three, four intervals, one, two, three, four intervals, one, two, three, four intervals. All those are work classes. One period away from either of those. Does that answer it? Okay. Now, we put quarter intervals there, but we haven't used it. What are those? What goes at the quarter interval? Say again? I can't hear it. My ear is terrible. Anybody? Why did we even write it down then? We use our C, that's got us where we started. We use our B to get our period. What have we not used yet? A! Okay. A gives us where you are at your quarter periods, okay? And since A is negative 3, from here you go down 3. That's what the minus does. It flips it across the x-axis. So you go down 3 here. Whoops, let me get my pen back. Down 3 here, which puts you up 3 there. So this is what this is tangent function looks like. They're going, coming from up here to down. Oh, you can put these in too. This will be a plus 3 here, a minus 3 here, a uh, plus 3 here, a minus 3 here, a plus 3 here. Okay, so that gives you a little something more to draw from. Of course, you got the intercepts here. Okay, that's what that tangent function looks like. Because of the minus sign in front, it's flipped across the x-axis. Because it's got a 3 in front, that's a vertical stretch. Okay, and because the tangent, the, the argument for tangent, is x is multiplied by 2, that's a horizontal shrink. Okay, remember, anything dealing with x is backward. So that shrunk it from, normally, the vertical asymptotes at the half higher is not a Does that make sense? Use all those parameters. That's what you got them for. Okay? They're helpful. Okay? Any questions? Make sense? Okay. That was example two. If you look in the book, they're close to being in nice of mine. Okay. So, this, we've already done example one. Now we move to the graph of the cotangent function. All right. <clears throat> we do the same kind of analysis here. The graph of cotangent function is similar to the graph of the tangent function, but different. Okay. Also has a period of pi. They're the only two trig functions that have a period of pi. Basic period of pi, anyway. However, from the identity, what is cotangent? Cosine over sine. So where do we, what concerns us about that? What concerns us about this ratio? Sine x cannot be zero. Yes, and where is a sine x usually equal to zero? Got to be zero somewhere, doesn't it? It stays between plus and minus one. It's got to be zero somewhere in between there. Where is it? Where is sine zero? Oh, 
come on. There you go. Okay, x equals zero. Okay, yeah. Of course, sine is zero. Y is equal to sine x is zero, where x y is zero. zero. Well, where does sine x equal zero? At your whole pies. Cosine zero at the half pies, sine zero at the whole pie. Remember, we said it started at zero, just like tangent, okay? So it's zero, and then pi is two pi, three pi, negative pi, negative two pi. Every whole pie sign is zero. So that further vertical asymptotes are for cotangent, okay? So you can see that the cotangent function is vertical asymptotes for sine of zero, which occurs at n pi. And could be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, negative 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Whatever. Integer. Any integer. Okay. Positive or negative. That's where your vertical asymptotes are for cotangent. Half pi is for tangent, whole pi is for cotangent. Okay? So this is the cotangent function, the simplest form of this. Okay? Shown below, two consecutive vertical asymptotes. Uh, Okay, we'll get to this other part later, uh, but this is just the cotangent function. Now, just the vertical asymptotes are at the whole pies. Put those in there. Halfway in between a vertical asymptote is the intercept, and halfway between the intercept and the vertical asymptote are plus a and minus a. Okay, remember the same as before. The a here was one, so plus one and minus one. Okay, those give you your points to graph. And of course, they're going to ask the so. Now, sometimes in the past I've had trouble remembering. Wait, now, I know that cotangent is the reciprocal of tangent, but that doesn't really help me a lot. Uh, but it's really useful to remember where is cotangent positive? Where are all your trig functions positive? Second? Quadrant one, that's between zero and pi half. So it has to be positive here, but it's going to a vertical asymptote here, so it's decreasing, always positive, in that first quadrant. All the trick functions are positive in the first quadrant, so be sure you get that, and then from there on, the rest fall into place. Okay, that's how I would know. And that it's plus one and minus, plus a and minus a, okay? So that's how you do that. So the basic cotangent function, Period, just like, like tangent, is pi. Domain is all the real numbers except the whole number pi, so integral pi's. Range, negative infinity to positive infinity, just like tangent was. Vertical asymptote, prettier. Domain couldn't be, that's where your vertical asymptotes are, at the end times. And this one's symmetric about the origin as well. See, what it does on this side is the opposite of what it does on this side. So that's what kind of function is symmetric about the origin? Second. What kind of function is symmetric about the origin? Alpha minus x is minus alpha x. Boy, that's an odd function. Yeah, it's odd. Because alpha, yeah, it does it. Even functions are the same on both sides. Odd functions are opposite on both sides. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. I hope it does. All right. Then they get into the next thing. What if you have uh, y is equal to a cotangent b x minus c? Well, just like before, a is no longer an amplitude, but it's plus or minus a, which you use on your quarter period. Okay? That's what you remember about A. The B, just like before, it's related to the period in pi over B. Not 2 pi over B, that's sine and cosine, but pi over B. And C is related to the phase shift. The way they write it, phase shift is C over B. The way I do it, it's factor the V out, which makes it that, and then what's left over there is C. That's always your starting point. And remember for cotangent, it starts at positive infinity. So it's, uh, its intercept is going to be half a period away, either side of the uh, phase shift. This one, the phase shift is zero. What's that? 
Yeah, the, the initial value because sine is zero and cos has a sort of cosine over sine, so it started at the same yeah. Now, if the coefficient in front, if this a was negative, it'd be starting negative. All right, any question? Good question. All right, let's do example three. Sketch the graph of y is equal to two cotangent of x over three. Where do I suggest you begin? Identify your parameters. A is what? Two. Next, B is one third. Okay, what does that relate to? The period is what? Pi divided by B, which would be pi over one third, which would be three pi. Okay, that's, that makes me hungry. Okay. And C, of course, is zero. They haven't given you any face shifts with these yet. Don't bank on them. Okay. So I think we're ready to graph, aren't we? Okay. Okay. What's the question? What's that? I can't hear. Oh, yes, you're right. What is the interval? The period is 3 pi. What is your interval? Yeah, 3 quarters pi. Good. Excellent. Okay. So, <laughs> that makes for a little mess here, doesn't it? So here's, I'm going to tick off 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And the negative 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Up, we got to go at least... 1, 2, negative 1, negative 2. So this will be, <laughs> oh, these are our intervals. Yuck. 3 pi fourths. This would be 3 pi halves. And let's just go on over here. 1, 2, 3, 4, 3 pi. 1, 2, 3, 4, 6 pi. Negative 3 quarters pi. Negative 3 halves pi negative 3 pi, 1, 2, 3, 4, this will be negative 6 pi. Okay. Now, um, most of the others I start with where they began. But remember what we just said, cosine begins with at a vertical asymptote. And since your phase shift is zero, that makes the origin, that makes the y-axis a vertical asymptote. And then how far are your vertical asymptotes apart? What's that? Every period. That's when things repeat. Every period, right? Okay, and what's your period? 3 pi. So we put another one here, and another one here, and another one here, and another one here. So get your vertical asymptotes in place. Okay? Now, what's in between every vertical asymptote? Smack dab in between. And intercept. Okay, so let's go back to our dark color here. And we'll do an intercept here, an intercept here, an intercept here, and an intercept there. Okay? Now, what's halfway between the intercept and an asymptote? A, plus or minus A. Okay? So here, that's why I do the quarter period still. And your A here was 2. So it's going to be a plus 2 on this side and a minus 2 on this side. A plus 2 on this side, a minus 2 on this side. Plus 2 on this side, minus 2 on this side. Plus 2 on this side, 
minus 2 on this side. Aren't you getting sick of me saying that? Okay. Yeah, I heard that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now connect the dot. It wasn't that funny. Okay. So we go down here. We go down here. It's always approaching the vertical asymptote. Never touching. Always getting closer and closer to them. Okay. There's your cotangent function. Typically, this is how cotangent looks. Cotangent is usually increasing. Cotangent is usually decreasing. The only thing that make a difference with that, if you had a minus sign, we flipped it over. This one had a plus sign. That so looks perfectly fine. See how we use our our three? It would have used four if they gave them to us. Well, not three. Uh, but they kept giving us C's of zero. So there was no phase shift. If there was a phase shift, that's where you begin. And that's where a cotangent would be a vertical asymptote. No phase shift, vertical asymptote is where you can get. Yes? Can you explain what? How I did them? How I found them? Okay, determine them. Okay. Okay, the only two vertical asymptotes so far are tangent and cotangent. Okay. How you determine that is think, ooh, uh, what is a tangent? Sine over cosine. So anywhere the cosine is zero, vertical asymptote, so you can never divide that zero. Okay? And, and, so, and cotangents are zero at your half pies. So drawing the vertical asymptote there. If you're doing the cotangent, cotangent is cosine over sine. So we're at sine zero at the whole pies. So that's where I did it. Okay? Uh, so the zero pi is the vertical asymptote. Unless there's a phase shift. If there was a phase shift, wherever that is, that's where the vertical asymptote goes to the cosine. The cotangent. The tangent, that's a oh, that's a half intercept. And yeah. then you go half a period on either side. Yeah. Because tangent starts at the intercept. Zero. Okay? Cotangent starts at the asymptote. The sine of cosine, cosine at zero is one. Ten, the sine is zero, so you're starting at the origin, okay, at an intercept. And then uh, cotangent is cosine of sine. Cosine is one, yeah, at zero, so that's always hard. Wherever your phase shift is, that's going to be a vertical asymptote for uh, cotangent. All right. That's kind of how they look. Let's see how the book did them. I know they do them a slightly different way. If you like their way better, go for it. I'm not going to be hurt. Okay? Perfectly okay to do. They start by solving those two equations, which are perfectly fine to do. That gives you x equals 0 and x equals that 3 pi. Exactly what we got. We used the b there to get it. They did too, but they just didn't tell you that's what they were doing. 0 and 3 pi, those are your first two vertical asymptotes, and then they're one period apart from there, which is 3 pi. You can also use two consecutive vertical, you can see the two consecutive vertical asymptotes at 0 and 3 pi. Between those, smack dab in between 0 and 3 pi, you're going to have an intercept of 0. Okay? And smack dab in between those two at your 3 quarter pi, at your quarter period, you're going to have your they do them, but they never refer you and say that's when your age on. Yeah, if they just said that, it would make a lot of sense. Okay? But I'll say it for them. So this is how it looks, and that looks a lot like mine. Oh, maybe not. It's pretty, but almost. Vertical asymptotes at the period, the half pipe, Pi. Your intercepts halfway between the periods at three halves pi, and your uh, plus or minus a's, which is plus or minus two, at your quarter period. So they didn't draw in the quarter period; they went by other things. So th that's why drawing in the quarter period helps you pinpoint right where they go. Make sense? All right. 
now let's see yes now we're going to do the graphs of the reciprocal functions well cotangent was already a reciprocal tangent but that's not what they talk about reciprocals of sines and cosines now this is where things get a little different okay even though you use them for tangent and cotangent by identifying what your asymptotes were, here we're going to use them for a more important reason to draw your graph. You can obtain the graphs of the two remaining trig functions, secant and cosecant, from the graphs of sine and cosine. So it would be cosecant and secant. Cosecant is 1 over sine. You all remember that, right? Reciprocal of sine, secant is reciprocal of cosine. For instance, at a given value of x, the y coordinate of the secant. <coughs> is the reciprocal of the y-coordinate of cosine. Since cosine stays in between plus or minus 1, secant stays outside plus or minus 1. Because the reciprocal of that will be a bigger number. Because that, the, the number is fairly small, reciprocals are going to be big. Okay? Of course, when cosine is 0, secant is undefined. Meaning? Vertical asymptote graph. So it's just like tangent. Because tangent was sine over cosine, secant is 1 over cosine, so your vertical asymptotes are going to be identical to tangent. Okay? There is a difference there. Okay. Uh, so one of the first things we're going to do is identify those vertical asymptotes. Uh, so I would say near. So it's the behavior of secant function is similar to that of tangent function. What they mean is it's going to an infinity. Okay? They're vertical asymptotes. All right. So this saying the other words I just said. Tangent sine over cosine, secant is one over cosine. So they have vertical asymptotes at the same location everywhere cosine is zero, which is your half pots. Okay, cotangent is cosine over sine, cosecant is one over sine. So they have the same vertical asymptotes all your whole number pies, okay? To sketch the graph of the secret or the post-secret function, don't find any points. What you do, make the sketch of the two circles, the sine over the cosine. And we know how to do that, don't we? Where were you the last two sections of the uh, sine and cosine? Okay, we'll do it. We'll go over that. For instance, to sketch the graph of y is equal to secant x, first find y is equal to the graph y is equal to sine x. Then take the reciprocals, and I'll show you how to do that graphically. It's really pretty easy. Okay? Well, they show you. Uh, let's just go to this. Let's do this one. Is that the next one? Then we'll come back and I'll let you see it. Okay, yeah, this is the next one. Sketch the graph of y is equal to 2 cosecant x plus pi fourths. Oh boy, they start with an easy one, don't they? Well, I'm not about to start with cosecant. What will I start with? My first graph will be, what color you want it? Purple? Okay, we'll do y is equal to, keep the same a, 2, what's the reciprocal function of cosecant? Second, sine of x plus pi fourths. Okay, let's identify our parameters. That's where we always begin, right? What's your first one? A is equal to 2. What does that relate to? This is a sine function, so you can say it. Say again. Amplitude. This is your amplitude is absolute value of 2, which is 2. Next. B is what? 1. And what does B relate to? Period. And how does it relate to period? 2 pi over b, and since your b is 1, the period is 2 pi. And then, as Ryan was going to uh, 
<coughs> interrupt to say what you do next. Interval. What's your interval? Pi halves. Is that what you said? Yeah, I thought so. Two pi, the period divided by four. Pi halves. Okay. And this one we do have a C. And what is a C? Okay. Minus pi fourths. Remember the C is always X minus C. So it's minus pi fourths. That's going to be our starting point. And this is a true C because your B is 1. You don't have to worry about whether the B is inside or outside the parentheses. It's 1. So that's going to be your starting point. <coughs> so since we have a phase shift of, pi, of minus pi force, interval of pi halves, we're going to have to use the quarter pies, okay, as our thing. So let me go back to my graph here. Say again. Okay, for the regular sign, this has a phase shift. You always start at your phase shift, and then that's where you identify your zero to be. Okay, so here is the graph of the sine function. Okay, I'm going to need at least two up and two down. Okay, one, two, minus one, minus two. I'm going to need the minimum between my phase shift and my interval, or least common denominator, and that's going to be 4. So this is going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, okay? Negative 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, okay? These are going to be pi force, pi force, pi halves, pi, one, two, three, four, two pi, minus pi force, minus pi halves, minus pi, one, two, three, four, minus two pi. One, two, okay, I can't do any more. Okay, we do the sign first. Where does sine normally start? At zero. But we start at the phase shift, which is minus pi force. So that's where your zero is for sine. Oops, sine was purple, right? Yeah. So let's go back to purple. Okay. That's where your sine is. Okay. And then one interval away, which is pi halves, which is two quarter pies, so you count one, two, and that you go up to your two, one, two, you're down to zero, we went to two, but it disappeared, and we went to, okay, they're disappearing, one, two, and down to minus two, one, two, and back to zero, one, two, and back to positive two. Going the other way, one, two, and you're down to negative two, one, two, up to zero, one, two, up to two, one, two, down to zero, and so on. So here's what the sine function looks like. We're not at all interested in what the sine function looks like. But we have to draw it first in order to get our cosecant function. So you do all the work on sine, get it correct, and then this cosecant is a piece of cake. And here's why. Everywhere that sine is zero, what is the cosecant? What happens to cosecant there? Vertical asymptote. Because remember, cosecant is 1 over sine. So anywhere sine is 0, vertical asymptote. Just put them in. You don't have to think about it. You don't have to do anything. Once you've drawn that sine curve, then everywhere it crosses the x-axis, that's a vertical asymptote. And I think I missed it there. Okay. Right there. Get out of there. Okay. Now, So you got your vertical asymptotes. Now we use the reciprocal. We already have used it some, okay? And here's what, and by the way, you, I see you counting. Let's see, your vertical asymptote should be 
every two should be one period because one's on the upswing, one's on the downswing. So they should be every half period. Your period was two pi, they should be every pi. Well, these are quarter pi intervals. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Yeah, four quarters pi is a pi. So, yep, yeah, that's, that's exactly right. So here's how you draw your... Uh, your cosecant. 1 over 1 is 1, right? It's a reciprocal of sine. So when sine is 1, cosecant is 1, right? Then you go toward a vertical asymptote. Here you have a minus 1. 1 over minus 1 is minus 1. Then go toward the vertical asymptote. 1 over 1. So at the peaks and the valleys, they kiss and go in opposite directions because they're reciprocal. Second? Okay, there they have it. So, you do all the work using the A's, B's, C's, and everything for your reciprocal function, the sine or the cosine. Get those right, and then everywhere that your reciprocal function is zero, that's going to be a vertical asymptote. Guaranteed, because that's what the reciprocal is zero is undefined, going to infinity. That's it. You graph the sine or co for cosine, cosecant, graph the sine first. For secant, graph the cosine first. Using your parameters, just like you named them before, and once you've got them done, you don't even worry about them anymore. Draw your vertical asymptote for the, the uh, sine or cosine is zero, and then at the maxes and mins, you have them kiss and go in opposite directions. Okay? Uh, All right, you got the sine bound box, right? Okay. Everywhere the sine crosses, it hits the, the x-axis, that's the intercept. Vertical asymptote, vertical asymptote, vertical asymptote, vertical asymptote. Because 1 over 0 is undefined. So that's how a vertical asymptote is. The function can't touch that. That's why I draw it in red. You can't be there. Stay away, okay? You cannot touch the vertical asymptote. You get awfully close, but you never touch it. Okay? Some of mine actually look like they touch, but that's just a mess. Okay. And then, at the peaks, they touch. Peaks and valleys, they touch. And then they go in opposite directions. And it's just one toward a vertical asymptote from there. Nothing else you have to worry about. Okay? Your, uh, all your intervals and everything else, your phase shift, everything, you do it with the sine function. Or cosine, if that was a secret. And then, once you've got that in place, where they cross the x-axis, those are your vertical asymptotes. Peaks and valleys are where they kiss, and then they go in opposite directions. Is it always, always going to be like that? Always going to yep. be max and minimum? Yeah. Can't do anything about it. Yeah. I wish I could make it harder, but I just haven't figured out a way to do so. Are you saying it will always be like that? Yeah. Yeah. Secret and cosecant will always be like that. First do sine or cosine and then use that pattern. Anywhere sine or cosine crosses the x-axis, vertical asymptote. And then peaks and valleys, kiss and go. Okay. Make sense? All right. Second? Okay. Okay, now that was tangents and cotangents. For sines and uh, for secants and cosecants, do the sine and cosine. Do all your periods and everything else using them, and then just look at the graph and where it crosses the x-axis. That's got to be a vertical asymptote. Okay, so and you you identified every one of those because that was one of your quarter period quarter period. Just picking the right one. All right, so that was. Their, my version of example four, let's see their version. Begin by sketching the sine function, the reciprocal function of the secant or cosecant. This happens to be sine, using exactly the same parameters. Now they do the amplitude two, they say it all, period two pi. They don't tell you how they got it, but that's using A, B, and C. Okay? And then they solve these equations, and that's how they get their 
their endpoints of the periods. Minus pi force, which is what we got by doing the other way, and then do one period over from there on. Okay? Uh, so that gives you your one cycle. Now remember, what's that? Okay, this is how they do it. They, they, okay, they go back here and say a sine function has a period of 2 pi. So let this thing be 0 and let that thing be 2 pi. And then you got the end of your period. Because the, the, the period for sine and cosine is 2 pi. Okay, think about it. You start here, go all the way around the circle, and you start back again. That's one period. The sine and cosine do the same, they repeat their pattern every two pi. That's what a period is. Now, tangent cotangent is every pi because they're uh, plus, minus, plus, minus, so they repeat it every pi. So the sine and cosine repeat every two pi. So that you just have to know. Okay? So set that to be 0 and 2 pi, that thing that sends the parentheses. And when you solve that one for x, you get x equal minus pi force. When you set the other one, that would be 2 pi minus pi force. Well, 2 pi would be 8 fourths pi, minus 1 fourth pi would be 7 fourths pi. So those are your ends. That's, I don't like this, but that, that's what you do, okay? That's the ends of one period, from minus pi force to 7 fourths pi. It's 2 pi apart, one period apart, but you just shift it. If you just started with the phase shift and did the phase shift, then it all works out. Okay. So, that was your, your phase shift minus pi fourths. That's where you start your sign and go up and down from there. And uh, it ends at 7 pi fourths. Yeah, at 7 pi fourths, which is right there. This is pi, pi halves, or no, pi, three halves pi, and seven fourths pi, okay, and then two pi. So it ends there. But you got one more in between because yeah. sine goes up and down, you know, so you got another intercept here, okay? Uh, the way I did it, you started here and then count your periods, uh, or count your intervals. One, two, there was one. One, two, there was one, one, two, there was one, one, two, there was one. So do the intervals and in, in that. It does the same thing. To me, it's just not as simple, okay? Maybe you find mine more complicated. I don't know. But anyway, get your sine function drawn. Once it's drawn, everywhere it crosses the x-axis is where the glasses go. And then your peaks, they go up, and the valleys they go down. Peaks go up, valleys go down. That's all you have to do to draw it. And how in the world we run out of time so fast in this class, I don't know. Or even have my watch out, that's one reason. Is it time? Sadly, it is. Okay. Homework exercises here. Where do we begin next time? Um, oh, we go back and do graphs of reciprocal function. I skip this page. And we'll go back. Remind me not to do example four again. We've already done it. Okay. Homework exercises here. Do any of the? I would do all of the all of the problems nine through fourteen. Only the odd answers are in the back and at calpchat.com. But you should be able to match them up all of them. Check your answers for nine through thirteen. Okay. This is page three fifteen. Then do any of the odds, 15 through 37. There's a whole parcel of them there. Uh, and all of those are at Calc Chat. 19's at Calc U. Uh, you can try doing any of the odds, 39 to 47, as well. Uh, stop there, and we'll do the rest of those next time. Good deal. All right. Have a good weekend. Of course, Working Trig will make it a good weekend, right? And... Uh, some of you have already done your test. Others of you be working on that as well. Anyone not get a copy of the test? He had a test on the first four sections. Take home test.
Okay. It sounds like you probably didn't, but. I mean, every time I miss a day, you get a test or a quiz or something. Yeah. These, these guys are getting used to it. They just say, oh, he's not here. Here comes the test. They'll say, where's my test today? He's not here. Okay, no, no, no. Well, no, 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 because I didn't have nothing stable to the back of it. Yeah. You haven't turned it in, I'll tell you that much. <laughs> have you done it? Uh, you, I think I have it in my book bag. Oh, it's in your book bag? Okay. Yeah, well, that's what I'm going to show you. I got some in my book bag. Well, that must be it. That's the only thing I've passed out. Yeah. Okay. Oh. <laughs> I feel like you just give yourself out when I'm not here. You just take you just take advantage of the fact that I'm not around. Well, well I guess I'll give out tests. You make it easy. <laughs> that's it, isn't it? Okay. Making the parts of this. Actually, this is from your uh, previous class. <laughs> I made an 82 on this. It's oh, also, wow. also mad. Oh, okay, got it. So that was a different test, okay. It was a different class, okay. I got all my old yes, Did you get the thing sent in? Yeah, I did. Okay, I good. Uh, Thank you. Yes, sir. So the way my uh, degree plan is set up, I have to take um, calculus one in the summer. Uh -huh. And I was wondering if you were going to be teaching that class um, or somebody. Yeah, uh, on this campus, I'm scheduled to teach it. On the Birmingham campus, Ms. Bart is scheduled to teach it. Okay. So we got one on each campus. Okay. So one should make. Do you know which uh, summer term you're doing it in? It's going to be, there's, there's a 10-week summer term. Okay. Uh, don't do it on a mini term. Not five weeks. Not okay. calculus. Yeah. No, no. No, no, no. Ever. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. Just yeah. It, it's going to be a full 10 week, but that means the classes are really long. Yeah. Because they, I, I can't remember. Uh, normally they're an hour and 40 minutes on a regular term, so they're like two hours and 20 or something like that in the summer. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah. Gotcha. All right, good deal. Because you're a math major, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. What science are you planning to take? Have you decided? Probably physical science and physics. Well, choose one or the other. And actually, the physics will use your math more than physical science will. Okay. But you could do chemistry or biology, but only if you really need it, I would think. I think I'm going to do physics. Physics, okay. Uh, yeah, and you nine, right? could choose to do the calculus-based physics if you wanted to, uh, but you have to wait till you finish Cal 1. Okay. If you do the trig-based physics, you could do that uh, as soon as you finish. You know, you could start that in the summer if you wanted to. Okay. Yeah. So, whichever you want to do. All right. Thank you. Uh-huh. Glad to. You too. Thanks. Don't know what's your major? Uh, computer science. Computer science. Okay. The transferable type, right? Yeah. I don't have as many maths as he does. Oh, too bad. Yeah. Okay. <laughs>